What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is David Bedrick. Uh, David is a process work therapist. He's a teacher and writer and also a family law lawyer. He writes a column for the Huffington Post and for Psychology Today. And he's the author of Talking Back to Dr. Phil, Alternatives to Mainstream Psychology. So welcome to Madness Radio, David Bedrick. Thanks, Will. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And David, I'm really inspired to have you on the show because I want to really go into this question of what is power, what is privilege. Uh, this is something that isn't spoken about in psychology. It's not something that therapists or mental health professionals are really trained to think in terms of oppression and social justice and power, and yet it's completely there all the time in the therapeutic profession. And you've written a really intriguing book where you challenge the way in which Mainstream pop psychology represented by Dr. Phil, the um, television uh, psychologist celebrity, how his whole approach just completely ignores the power and social justice issues involved with the people he's uh, working with. So it's great to have you on the show. This contradiction, this complexity of power and voice and representation, it really comes in in your work in family law that you were involved with a lot of divorce proceedings, for example, and you had a very unique perspective on that. Tell us about that. In Portland, Oregon, and some other cities have this, but not many, the judges are empowered to appoint an attorney to represent the child. Now, some people know the term guardian ad litem, like if a kid gets arrested. This is very different. This says if let's imagine that people have enough funds, which is another issue because many people don't have funds and don't have lawyers at all. But let's imagine that, that there's two parents, both parents have attorneys. The child usually doesn't have an attorney, almost never does. No one says, I'm representing that child, their needs, their interests. So the cultural assumption, and the courts go along with that, is that the parents and the courts, a bunch of adults, will know what's best for the child. Well, they may actually know heck of a lot, and we certainly need their voice. But what about the child's knowledge, even if they can't say it quite as, as easily or as understandably to an adult? What about their knowledge, their experience that says, this is what, this is what I might need? How does that come in? Well, often it comes in indirectly through psychologists, maybe. But my job was to represent them themselves so I could go into court and examine and cross-examine people if the parents didn't have the interest of the child at heart, and those were the cases that I got involved in, they were always the worst of the worst, then I could try to bring in that point of view or challenge a parent's point of view or challenge a counselor's point of view with what I knew about, uh, about a child. So I'm thinking about one case where there was a parent who thought he knows best what, what would be good for his children and it would be best for them to move and spend more time with him. And the children were older, they were in their early teens, and they, most of their life was involved in their school and their friends and their clubs afterwards. And the, so they spent most of their day wrapped up with their friends in school. But father, from his point of view, thought the best thing is for the kids to be closer to him. He was not only an easy character. So I'll just mention that in the background. So, but I listened to the kids I went to their school, I talked to their teachers, I looked at their grades. It looked like school was the best place they had in their lives, right? Neither parent were they really thriving under. But in school, they had friends and they enjoyed themselves and they did things that were interesting. In fact, they often wanted to do so many extracurricular activities because they didn't want to come home, right? Because <laughs> their home was a difficulty. So I ended up advocating for those kids to stay wherever they could continue going to the same school. That was, that was their position. The father didn't like that idea, didn't, uh, didn't, didn't think there, that was very good, and I ended up having him on the stand in court and uh, questioning him about, why, about his level of trust for his kid's judgment in front of a judge, such that the judge can see that this parent had their own interest, not the child's interest uh, at heart. And your legal representation was based on talking with the children and really getting a sense of their 
perspective, which maybe is not something that was always included in the whole process as each as each side in the battle kind of lined up to uh, get its uh, interest advanced. That's exactly right. So I would be connected to and representing and forwarding the kids' interest. I would get to interview the parents as well, but not so to, not with the orientation of how do I advocate for them, but to see if they get it. Do you get your children? Because I could, as a counselor too, say this is where your kids are coming from. What if your kids said this or that? What if they say they'd rather be in uh, stay in the same school? And I could see their reactions to, to that. So I could begin to read them also and give them feedback or their lawyers feedback uh, to try to influence that system by again bringing in the voice that would have the least power in the system which is going to be the children's. There was a young man who was quite frightened of his father actually and uh, he was intimidated by him I think for good reason his father was intimidating not in the best of senses and um, his father told him that if he didn't speak up for wanting to be with the dad and didn't get rid of me as the attorney, <laughs> that, that he would lose the relationship with his father. Basically said, you know, this is what you're doing. You know, you're going to lose your relationship with me. And this young, uh, I call him young man, but he was like, again, 12, 13 years old in that range, ended up writing a letter to the court saying, you know, kind of a, a 12 year old letter, right? <laughs> saying a uh, hand, handwritten letter saying, uh, I don't really need to have an, a lawyer. I, I know what I need for me. So this was a, quite a conundrum for the courts because do we now this is what the kid's saying, but there's a coercion in the background. So in that case, the judge got the lawyers together and me together. And um, I knew enough of the child. I knew who the child was staying with. I got communications from the child indirectly because he was not willing to talk to me because he was frightened to. And um, convinced the judge that he was being coerced, but how to handle that was rather tricky. But it did get handled and it did respect everything the child said. But later on in his years, one of the most touching things, about three years later, he wrote me a note. <laughs> and he said, I'm really frightened. I was really scared. I was really scared of my dad. I'm really sorry. It all worked out fine anyway. But it was a, one of the sweeter moments of my legal uh, career, one of the, uh, the a sweet compensation. Not just that he appreciated me, but that he actually was now finding his voice, right? <laughs> He's saying, now I'm standing up to my dad. I couldn't do it then. So I guess in the long run, he found his own power like we're talking about. And I think he's going to fare better in the world. Do you think that's really key, David, when we're talking about social justice and privilege and oppression issues, that we're really talking about voice and what person's voice is included, what person's voice is excluded I'm thinking of a client I worked with in my counseling practice. The mother brought her son, I think he was about eight, and he had gotten in trouble in school a number of times. And on the public transporta uh, transportation uh, association or something, he had spit at a bus driver, and then he cursed out another bus driver. And he had other situations in schools where he acted inappropriately in certain situations. And uh, when I sat with this kid, and uh, talked to him about this one bus driver, which was the last, it was one of the straws that was breaking the camel's back. They were going to have him expelled from school. I asked him about the bus driver. And interestingly enough, this bus driver didn't like certain people. He didn't like people who were physically disabled. He was very cranky and nasty with them and grumpy with them. He didn't like black looking people and, and Hispanic looking people and treated them badly. And this kid didn't know what to do other than spit at him. So uh, in that way, you could say his spitting needed words. He needed to learn to poo, <laughs> but, not to, but, but the spit itself was going to get him to a lot of trouble. So was going to eventually be his voice in saying, I disagree with this bus driver. I want to sound off to him. But this was the beginning of this person's voice. If we only said, this is a bad kid, he's acting inappropriate, let's stop him from spitting, and didn't consider the possibility that he had a voice and was speaking up for other people then we would miss something really beautiful about this person, which could potentially grow into his career or his calling or, or what would be meaningful to him in his life. So this is something that we, we talk about quite a bit on Madness Radio, that um, you know behaviors or 
ways of communicating or states of consciousness that are difficult or disruptive or painful that sometimes you might just want to get rid of, that you just say, look, this is a symptom, this is a disorder, that actually, if you if you put it in context, it makes a lot of sense that it's coming from somewhere, it's actually got a purpose, it's got a message behind it. If you can get into the deeper set of surrounding environmental factors that are involved. And so I think it really resonates with that. And, but I think that also, you know, the other side would come in and say, well, look, look, wait a second. What about personal responsibility? And, you know, you're talking about privilege, you're talking about social justice, you're talking about voice and oppression, but isn't there a basic line that says you have to behave responsibly, you have to be responsible for yourself, and and you can't use a so-called social justice framework to explain away the responsibility that people that people have for their own behavior. Yeah, it's a it's a really important discussion that you're bringing up. Certainly, that voice, that that opinion and orientation belongs also. So, in some way, we could say it was good that someone stops this kid and doesn't say, "Go ahead, spit. We're fine with you. We understand." Right? Somebody has to stop him in this story. It's good that somebody polices, as it were, stops him, says that's not okay. But then now that we've stopped him, now that we've put him in a temporary prison in a way, right, we're not going to let you do some certain things. You are unfree to act in certain ways, dear youngster. That's his momentary prison, that lack of freedom. Then while we're in that prison, when we have him locked in that place, can we do something that is really going to help that particular problem? We know in the prison system, the recidivism rate, people go back out and do many of the same things and, or people end up more jaded, less able to function in society, many people, than they ever did. So the hope that this system that stops the person, which we need, but the hope that system is now going to rehabilitate a person or transform them, highly unlikely. So we need both. Something should stop the person take away certain freedoms, in this case spitting, but then while we have taken away their freedoms, hopefully we can delve into things and find a solution that might be more sustainable right? than what we're going to find by just saying we're going to keep you in prison. Otherwise, we have a prison system basically inside and out and in families. I remember when I was teaching uh, a critical thinking class, we were talking about uh, homosexuality and we were having a debate about, about that and some people who had, more, had a certain viewpoint said, oh, that's not a good thing. This being gay is not okay with me. I think it's, it's morally, essentially, spiritually wrong. And then somebody said to that person, well, what would you do if you had a child, a young girl, let's say, who says, Daddy, I like girls. I'm attracted to them. I'm interested in them. They seem appealing to me. I, I think I'd like to be with girls more than boys, even in the conventional way, uh, sexually, or, or a young kid, uh, the young kid's attraction. And this one guy said, my kid did that, I'd lock her up in the room. And I wouldn't let her out, right? So, you, so if you get the sense that something should be, he thinks something should be stopped, we have, that's, a, that's worthy discussion. But then the method he's going to use to uh, resolve that problem is going to create a relationship between him and this, this imaginary daughter that's going to be a rather lousy one, right? So now when that kid does go out, What's going to happen? Who knows? That kid's going to either be very confined and break out or that kid's going to do things that are going to look a lot less responsible. Maybe that kid will get into sexual relations that are very dangerous because when people hold back too much, one thing we know as counselors, you and I will, if people bottle something up inside too much, when it does come out, it doesn't usually come out in some gentle, reasonable, rational, thought out way. <laughs> It just comes out, right? Or if they're a young person just discovering their sexuality and starting to become active and involved with other people, they may lose out on the guidance that their parents could give them and helping them navigate that very, very complicated process because now they can't talk about their relationships because basically dad has said, no, you're you're locked away. I'm not going to let you be having same-sex uh, interests. You know, it's not something. And so the person is really on their own. So it actually ends up making the situation a lot worse. And I think that's really intriguing, David, because I think that um, sometimes, you know, with an emphasis on meaning and understanding context and really getting a sense of where something is coming from, I think that a lot of the mad pride movement or people who are interested in a different view and a different way of working with psychosis can get accused of, well, you're really just indulging people. You're really just romanticizing this. You're really um, just sort of saying that it's that it's not a problem, that people just need to get over it and accept the fact that someone is, 
you know, doing things that are very, very self-destructive or very, very problematic or causing all kinds of problems for the people that they're living with. And what you're saying is actually the emphasis should be on bringing the voices in and creating a relationship between them and not just pushing away, locking away, putting it in that prison, but not also just rebelling, that actually you need a relationship between all the different voices that are involved in uh, in the situation. Mm, that's well said. I, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, Will, as you're talking about women and body image and diet, where I've written some chapters and, and on that and, and done some research, and you get these dynamics very clearly there. A lot of times a person, usually a woman person, is going to look in the mirror and then her eyes will see something very unpleasant. In fact, about 97 plus percent of the women have that experience, so it's not a rare experience. And their eyes will see something and, and will have thoughts, and those thoughts will be, if I said them on the air, people, they're, they're gross. People will think they're unattractive. No one's going to ever love you. Look at you. You should wear these kind of clothes. You should be hidden. You're ugly. You're disgusting. You're undisciplined. You're fat and worse. The way people, the things are in people's heads uh, around body image and other things, uh, but in this case, are so horrendous. So then, what happens? So that person puts them in cells in a prison. It's called I'm not allowed to do certain things, and I'm not allowed to eat certain things. I'm going to be on certain diet programs. That's my prison. I'll drink water, eat salads. I'm not going to eat hamburgers and ice cream or whatever, right? So people put themselves in these little prisons. Sounds good, and I'm going to exercise. What could be wrong with taking a person who? is heavier than some norm, what could be more logical than saying, why don't you eat uh, different foods and exercise more? What's wrong with it? Well, now we, now we should think more deeply about that and add a few number of things. One is many people think that who don't need to lose weight, about 80% of fourth grade girls, fourth grade, by 10 years old, 80% of girls are looking at themselves, dieting to lose weight, taking their fat, about 30% are overweight. That means most of them are just hating their bodies by 10 years old. That doesn't sound so good. So that orientation is now filtered in to young girls who are already ashamed and hating themselves. There are more people, especially women, who die of eating disorders than die of obesity. Interesting. So we're telling people, put yourself in this exercise diet prison, but many people are being hurt more than the problem. Yes, that's actually literally true if you look at the research. So I can go on with more things, but then you have that as your basic problem. But let me say one more fascinating thing. This is a, this is a very consistent finding in my own research. Let's, let's go back to that story. This woman looks in the mirror and she goes, oh my gosh, look at you, right? And has a whole series of, of, of accusations and, and disgust and self-hatred. And she yells at herself, and that part that yells at her, look at you, you're this, you're disgusting, you're fat, you're ugly. I'm sending you to Joe Eat Less diet program, right? And there's zillions of them, right? It's a $60 billion industry. There's tons of options, right? I'm sending you to that program, you nasty, ugly creature, right? <laughs> Sends it to that program. Now imagine that this, this woman has something in her, like most of us, who doesn't like being called fat, ugly, disgusting, un unworthy of everything. Let's imagine even that that's a part of the person that's even self-loving. If that person feels better about themselves, they might not only lose weight, they might say to this other part that's saying you're ugly, you're fat and disgusting, screw you, you know? I don't think I want to hang around with people like you very much. I'm starting to feel good about myself. So what happens? You get a person who sends themselves to the diet program based on a kind of shaming, self-hateful attitude, feels a little bit better about themselves, says screw you, and leaves the diet program, looks like they're gaining weight, losing weight, gaining weight, losing weight. To them, it looks like they're sabotaging their very goal. But what's really happening is they're beginning to feel better about themselves and don't agree with the whole premise. Inside of them, they're not agreeing with how they're being evaluated, how they're being put down, how they're being objectified. They've internalized an outer culture that says, you're a woman, you're here to please certain men. Please go do that in the way you look and act. Something in them, maybe the best in them, is not so willing to do that. That same part of them goes against the diet program. That's the part we need to find if we want to go further. It flips back and forth. People often in that situation, but in other situations too, would say, I'm, I'm disgusting. I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm, I, I started doing it. I'm now going to figure it out. I'm now going to really get it. I'm so undisciplined. I finally figured it out. I'm 53. I've been, I've been off and on diets for 40 years. Now I got the answer. 
different program, Will, but the same attitude. Now I got the answer. You're a piece of crap who really doesn't get it, who really is not disciplined, and now I'm going to make you do it. But that attitude, I'm being a little harsh with it, so, so forgive me for that. But that attitude is the same attitude. They're applying the same medicine in that way. And that medicine, the research says that diet programs sustain a, a success 5 to 10% of the time. That's all. So David, what you're saying is that people have internalized an element of oppression, and then somehow they've pushed away, they join with the oppressor against themselves, and they push away the inner part of them that might be standing up for freedom. And then they say, well, that's not okay. That part that's standing up for freedom, that's part of the problem too. But then that doesn't last. And then eventually the part that wants freedom throws off the oppressor part. And all this happens as an inner process. I'm thinking of a woman, I, this would be a good example that I worked with. She loved caramel lattes, big giant ones with with whole milk and caramel and all this stuff. And they were, I don't know how many calories. There were a lot of calories. I'm wanting to say six, 700, but I don't remember really a number, but it was a lot. And so caramel lattes were the culprit, right? We have to stop the caramel lattes for her to get a body that she would find more acceptable or maybe the culture would find more acceptable. So my question then, so you could say the rebellion is the caramel lattes. The culture says, you should be thinner, stop drinking those. So that's her basic battle. So she goes back and forth. She tries to stop drinking them. Then she wants them. The question that is unasked, like with the spitting kid, what is the person doing with the caramel lattes? What is so darn attractive about a caramel latte that despite all the criticism and all the people who think she's not attractive, that it still persists? That's a pretty strong power that can persist under that kind of criticism. If someone told me, David, you're no good unless you do something and barrage me with it, I might change, but she doesn't. She continues. So one day we were, she was in my office and I had a, a plastic water bottle and I said, imagine this is a caramel latte and you grab it and show me how much when you want it and you can't stop yourself, how much you want it. So she grabs this water bottle with a, with a fierceness and I grab the water bottle and I say, you can't have it. And we're in a tug of war with a water bottle, right? <laughs> it's a symbolic caramel latte. I say, no, you can't have it. She grabs it and she says, I want it. And we're going back and forth. And then pretty soon, she starts to look pretty real, like she's in a real battle. And I said, what do you need the damn caramel lattes for? She says, I just need them. I said, why? And she says, it's my happiness. Well, that was, and then she stops, right? And we're like, wow, that's big. Tell me about being happy. And she says, now here you get the gender part, the sexism, the culture. Well, I'm, I'm taking care of kids. And my husband doesn't want me to go out and follow a career, but I'm interested in finishing school and then going on to a graduate program and having a profession. But my husband doesn't really want me to do that. That would make me happy. So what she's doing with the karma lattes, you could say, is she practicing grabbing what she wants and being relentless. Now, she should grab these other things in her life, her schooling and her career with the same fierceness. She may have to tell her husband, which she eventually did, you know what? There are things I really want that'll make me happy in my life. I don't want to let go of those. So in that way, I call it, I call it karma latte yoga. She's practicing. <laughs> That's her practice right there. She's learning. And if we don't find that will, if we don't find what makes her happy and what the meaning of that karma latte is, I think she'll go up and down, up and down on her weight, maybe for the rest of her life. If we do, we've relieved the karma latte from its meaning, it's going to be much easier for her to stop drinking that because it doesn't represent the happiness of her life. It's now just a darn karma latte. <laughs> it's, not sad. it's not life happiness. So again, like to coming back to the example of, of the spitting, it's not about in, indulging cravings or adult, indulging addictive behavior. We still maybe want to say no to that or stop that eventually or have that be part of it. There's, that's a good impulse in a sense. But if we do it without understanding where that is coming from and, and realizing that that's an expression of a rebellion or expression of an unheard voice or an expression in this woman's example, an expression of her need for happiness against the limitations that the society and her relationship, um, her family are, are, are putting on her against her happiness. If we don't understand it, we're just creating a very unsustainable situation where we're just trying to put something psychologically in prison that's not going to stay. So this is very important because this is how psychology, mainstream psychology operates. 
you identify the defect and you get rid of it. It's like you see the disease, you see the illness, you see the blemish, you see the unvirtuous, the dirty part or the problematic part or the unwise part. And then you figure out ways to control it, quarantine it and eradicate it. And and this, this paradigm we see so much around mental health issues, around experiences that get called uh, psychosis, but actually it's much broader than that. And your your book, Talking Back to Dr. Phil, Alternatives to Mainstream Psychology, that's what you're tracing. You're tracing the same dynamic that repeats itself over and over and over again. Instead of seeing things as symptoms to be gotten rid of, a craving for a caramel latte, spitting the uh, a psychotic experience, for example, instead of seeing those as things to be gotten rid of, which is what mainstream psychology does, there's a different way, which is to see them as an expression of voice that hasn't been understood or listened to. That's a great thing. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of a number of examples, but I'm thinking of a story that came from my Dr. Phil show. There was a an African American woman and her son. And I'm not remembering his age, but he may have been seven, eight ish in that range. And he was the problem that they identified that Dr. Phil was going to help with was that he was spending a lot of time on sports and doing well at that, but not much time on what's called academics, math, English, and those kind of things. So the question was, what do we do about this youngster who is not doing very well in school, but is putting a lot of time in in sports? If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and we're speaking with David Bedrick. He's a process work therapist and family law lawyer, and he's the author of Talking Back to Dr. Phil, Alternatives to Mainstream Psychology. And we're talking about the psychology of power and social justice. It's a really significant example because you see how it's laden with race implications and the, the, all the stereotypes and all the conflicts and all the and also the realities of academic difficulties and economic inequality and family problems and it's a very real live example. So how did Dr. Phil deal with that? Dr. Phil wanted to convince this child and the child's mother that the child's dreams about sports, one day I'll be a uh, Michael Jordan or whatever it would be, right? Be like Mike, I'm thinking of those commercials, uh, that I'm going to be a great sports uh, person and that's going to be my way into, into the, the world as an adult. Dr. Phil tried to convince him that that's not realistic. Let me give you the statistics about how unlikely it is that you will become a professional ball player. And actually, dear youngster, uh, you, you know, you're, you're fooling yourself, you're just taking excuses uh, to not do your academics. And dear mom, how about a little more tough love with this child and make sure they're doing their their regular homework in addition to their uh, their athletic homework. There is some common sense element to that. There is a bit of a, well, you know, caramel lattes are not good for you. You know, focusing too much on sports is not wise for your own education. So there is a common sense element to that. And yet, how does it end up backfiring in your view? Right. I mean, in that case... Where in that case, there's a very simplistic or mainstream uh, view of what this child is doing. For instance, if you thought more about why, as you're implying, an African-American male uh, boy in school would be interested in sports, you would think this is not only about being physical, that there's a whole history of, alone of sports being a way of succeeding, not just succeeding financially, but succeeding getting respect. Uh, in resisting oppression and making and being a hero to people, in being disciplined, in being intelligent. So this this child is not only finding a way of avoiding his academic interests. He knows that there is a root that society has given some room for, and some African Americans have taken that root. The Dr. Phil approach tends to think, well, that's just avoiding all the hard stuff, the discipline, the intelligence, the respect you want in life. It's basically a sophisticated way of him saying, look, you're lazy. That's basically the message there. And in a way, in, in a real way, this kid wasn't lazy. He was working hard. And it wasn't just for to be a, a physical person the way the way the, the Dr. Phil might think. There, there was a study done, and I want to say it was at Stanford, and I could be wrong. And in this study, they have people watching videos of basketball players. And then they watch the videos, and then they talk to them about the different players. And one of the videos... They uh, show a team and a white ball player who is able to do very well in the game. And then the next one, they show a video where there's a black player who does similarly well, 
they set it up so it's, so it's very similar. And then they have people watch that. And when the people watch the black player, they say, people are likely to say, more likely to say, a stereotype. Well, the kid obviously has some physical gifts, but he's black, so he has some physical gifts. But the white player, they're more likely to talk about how intelligent the white player's basketball was, the thought, his basketball IQ. They're talking about all these other kind of factors. So where Dr. Phil is not seeing intelligence in this kid, this is the very place where he's thinking, this is where I've gotten to do it. This is where I've seen people do it. Not to mention, Will, the fact that the school systems around academics are really difficult for inner city kids. The, there's more likely to be bars on the windows. There's more likely to be teachers who have left those systems to go into the, into the suburban areas once they get good. There's less money put into those schools. By second or third grade, many of those kids are already written off as never being able to graduate high school. So it's not only that parent, let's focus on that parent, that woman, it's not only, let's not only look at her and say, look at you, you should be doing better with your kid. She's in a much bigger climb than, for instance, I was in as a child living in an area that had relatively good schools, no bars on the windows. I was likely to make it. So the lack of appreciation for that is also huge. You communicate not just to that child and mother, but to a whole audience. That show then, which goes out to millions of people, says, this is all about some kid who's spending too much time in his, with his sports and is not responsible enough and a mother who's not being tougher on her kid. And now nobody in the culture takes some responsibility for the deplorable conditions in the school systems, uh, how unlikely it is for that kid to get to school, how unlikely they are to earn a proportional amount of money to another particular person, etc. So we all get to be blind to all the dilemma that's wrapped around this scene. We don't witness that. We only witness that this unseen. Let me ask you this, David. How would you respond to that family? How would you respond to African-American clients or Latino clients that are grappling with this, this dilemma of fighting these forces that are racial and power-based forces, but that come across and, and meet them in very difficult ways to grasp because they do seem to be these very simple kinds of common sense sort of challenges that people see not as, as a racial issue. How do you engage with them in that way? I mean, if I were with that mother and her child, I, first of all, I would, have, I would have had a context in my mind. But the, but the first thing I would have done with that child, I would say, you're spending a lot of time with sports. Tell me about sports. Because there's probably all kinds of wonderful qualities, discipline, intelligence, pride, going for respect, wanting to be a success in life. There's probably all kinds of wonderful qualities that I don't want to throw out in this kid by saying that whole thing is bad. I may not notice that I'm actually throwing out exactly the kind of qualities, capacities, motivations that I actually need. If this child has got intelligence in there, passion in there, dreams about where they can go in their life through sports, I don't want to drop that too quickly. That brings us back to the example of the caramel latte. Look, there's a whole story of happiness in that caramel latte or the example of the, of the kid that's spitting. Look, there's a whole story of discrimination and, and being mistreated by a, an oppressive bus driver in that story that's, that would be missed if um, we just see this as something we have to get rid of and not talk about. That's right. And then we need to, and then as, as you are, are, are doing so well and we're doing it together, is some kind of education of the public so that if I could have my show, I guess, and done that, I would have wanted to use that as an opportunity to not uh, reinforce those kind of racial prejudices and biases and blindnesses to the audience, but educate people uh, about that. For instance, that mother, what kind of predicament she really is in. Uh, what kind of what kind of schools this kid is in, so that we have also a, a heart or a compassion for that predicament, and not only a uh, the judgment that we're likely to walk away with. Well, how do we avoid the pitfall of of being politically correct and just sort of taking a high ground of of denouncing racism and you know using an individual story as kind of like a flag to be against a system, especially as people with white skin privilege, as you and I are. I mean, basically, most people who have the privilege of, of whiteness in this culture just don't even talk about this kind of issue. You know, and if you do talk about it, you're going to get into arguments, going to get, you know, there's going to be hurt feelings, it's going to be complicated, it's going to be messy, it's much easier to just kind of avoid it. But what do you think are the responsibilities that people 
with privilege have in order to really grapple with these things. And also, especially people who are involved in the mental health system, maybe working as therapists or working as peers or or wanting to just help each other. What kinds of responsibilities do we have to engage our own privilege? And how do we do it in a way that's just not a simplistic kind of politically correct framework that ends up making us just feel guilty or just kind of hammering each other in a back and forth uh, tug of war that doesn't feel like it goes anywhere? It's a great question. I don't think I have an answer, but I have my I have ideas and things that I've seen that are helpful. And one thing I've seen helpful is when people look at their own personal or ethnic or cultural story and get to know something about what that condition is like, what it's like to be smaller or le- or less less powerful whether that's as a child or as a or as a woman or as a Jewish person or as a whatever it is that you can grab a hold of or just your own experiences what it's like to to feel not understood to feel put down in some way to feel like people don't get it and what the cost is what the pain is inside and what and the anger and all the different emotions around that when people are in touch with that for themselves they tend to be more likely to get it when they see it happening in another person can you give us an example of how that might work out because i think that's a really important thing that you're saying about look all of us need to get in touch with the ways that we've felt oppressed that we've felt put down and stepped on times in our lives when we didn't have a voice that's a very interesting way of of challenging us to get us to not, you know, not necessarily see ourselves as the bad guy, but see ourselves as somebody who's been on the receiving end. How, how, what's an example of how that would play out for people? Here's something I know from my counseling practice that this wouldn't be the right direction for everybody. But if a person has been hurt as a child, then then here's what I know from from helping that person. Let's say there's a there's a person who who as a child got hurt by one parent. Let's say that's a father. Let's say it was a physical hurt, a physical uh, assault, an abuse. We'd call it right. If I talk to that person about that and they're open to saying something about that, and I ask this question, Will, who was there? Who wasn't there? Who dismissed? What happened to you? Did the school not notice? Did the mother not notice? Did nobody know? And what happens to that person? That person is likely to walk around thinking, well, something was wrong with me. Something screwed up about me. That paradigm, being hurt and having somebody who doesn't get it, people can get that story. And that's very that's a similar story that they can lay on to other things. For instance, there's an African-American person. That person is having a hard time in school. How are we not seeing the context of that, of that particular difficulty? How are we the witnesses who are now not seeing that a person has been injured and not really uh, uh, witnessing back something difficult? What you're suggesting is that um, we need to have conversations from places of mutual vulnerability, that we need to see the ways in which we were not heard, that we weren't listened to, that we didn't get the support that we needed. And then to understand that that's what other people need, that you know, young, young people need that, that people who are suffering with dieting need that, people who are feeling like they're falling behind and, and, and they don't have the privileges that white skin might give them in that situation. People need a sense of a, of a witnessing and a listening to and a being with their vulnerabilities around that pain. And I think that this is this is one of the things that really gets us stuck in the race dialogue or the racism question in the United States is that, you know, everybody can find a a way in their own history, in their own path, even the most privileged person. We need, we need a lot of people thinking about it. You know, one, one image that I often have in my mind is let's say somebody punched you in the arm yesterday, really hard. You got a black and blue mark and it's sore. Right now, if I come over to you and say, "Hey, Will, how you doing?" and grab your arm, give it a little squeeze, like just saying hello, you might say, "Ouch!" Right now, with a person, with a quote-unquote normal person, without that wound, without that injury, no big deal. Right? I haven't done anything. But if I don't know the context, I won't know that I'm pressing on a wound. I don't know that I'm hitting you in a sore spot. That would be a physical example. Now, there are also psychological examples. If a woman has been sexually assaulted and that woman is now not only easy and comfortable and free in her sexuality, someone could say, what's wrong with you? 
you know, come on, you should be open to this. You should be this way sexually. You should be ready to go and we should give you this pill. We should get a man of Viagra. We should do these things to overcome that. Then we don't see that we're pressing right on a sore spot, a place that has a hurt, an injury there. Uh, if we take an African-American person says, how come you're not doing well in the school system? Well, there's been people who've been put down about their intelligence, who are put in certain schools, have a whole history about being maligned around, around their intellectual capacity. If we don't see that we're poking right at a wound, for somebody else it might not be. But for us, so that culture, education is, among other areas, is a, is a tender spot. So that means we should approach it in a certain way. We can still approach but if we, but we shouldn't poke. If you're a Jewish person like me, and you say, uh, "Hey, David, you got some money problems, right?" You should. It would be good for you to know that there's been some injury around how Jews are looked on around money and being greedy and stereotypes that have had a history and people hurt and people killed around certain prejudices. So if you poke me there, you might want to know that somebody's already hit me with that fist. You're poke. You're not just talking about money. You're poking a spot now. And if I act not only at ease with that or not reasonable in your mind that you may want to consider the possibility that there's a background story and that there's a black and blue mark there so if you poke me it's probably going to have a little bit more of a reaction i'm going to get i'm going to get more hurt or say ouch harder or yell at you more or something is not going to look too good for you this is the point at which the dialogue breaks down because i think that the uh, a mainstream response or kind of like a popular culture response or maybe a dr phil response might be something like wow well this is this is the victim this is the victim status this is basically you saying that we need to coddle you we need to be really sensitive to you and really you know what i want the freedom to just come up and slap you on the back i want to just be able to be free and say look you got some money problems what happens to freedom in this why is it that we're suddenly walking on eggshells i think that would be the devil's advocate position i think that's what happens in the culture when this kind of point of view around privilege and and um, oppression is and social justice is, is presented, people feel like, wow, that's the victim status. That's the victim language. I mean, if I were talking to a person who was saying, I want to be free to, to poke you around the money issue, and you were not sensitive to my request uh, to, to learn a little bit, to be caring and thoughtful about my, my story, then I'd say you are at risk of me being insensitive with you. That means poking you back. I guess we're going to poke each other for a little while. Oh, then the other says, oh, you're going to poke me back. Look, now you're you're a troublemaker. You're someone, you're overreactive. You're oversensitive. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. Look at you. You're not like these other people over here who are just going along and not not reacting and not responding. So this is a huge thing. That's the, that's the witnessing in the background. If the culture looks at those two people and sees me and my reactions as the messed up one, then we have a whole culture, right, that's going to, that's going to, help that person keep me down right if i in that case it's going to take a lot more empowerment or love or community or resources for me to stand up to that person however when i do if i do if i can overcome all that background suppression so that i can say to that person yeah with regard to you i'm going to be trouble you're trouble for me i'm going to be trouble for you if i can overcome what it takes to be able to do that i'm going to have acquired a certain kind of capacity self love or, or eldership to help a lot of people. That's a beautiful thing. And we have great examples of that in every community. So say a little bit more about this idea of eldership and the spiritual quality, because I, I think that that sometimes is seen as, as a goal. And wouldn't it be great if people can, you know, take the higher ground? But sometimes it's not so easy. It can end up just being a form of bypass or a form of self-repression. So what's your, what is your view of eldership and, and how people would really rise above this terrible dynamic, which can just basically just, just pull people down into, into conflict. I mean, for me, it's a, I write about what I call a love-based psychology in my book, which is not the sort of, let's just hug everything, but it's, it's, you have to hold if, if, as from a psychological point of view, maybe the prison systems and the religious systems and other cultural systems should be different. As a, as a counselor-oriented person, I think I have to hold the person where they are. If that person has never said, back off, Will, in their life, and they finally get to do that, even if it's me in the therapeutic room and they're my client and they say, you know what, I don't think you're so good at anything and they've never said that to anybody else, 
then a little part of me celebrates. And I think that's a good step. That's the next step for that person. I wouldn't tell that person to try to be more reasonable yet. But if that voice is pretty free and they can assert it pretty strongly and they can even back other people off or maybe injure them with their fury, then I think, well, maybe now it's time to think about uh, what other meanings, what other ways of expressions can they see the other person's position. So I think I see it in a developmental way. Uh, Martin Luther King writes, why we can't wait when he's in the Birmingham jail. People are saying, can't you wait a little longer? You're telling that to a person saying, I've been waiting for a long time. People are much more likely to suppress what they can for as long as they can. So their needs, our own eldership has to appreciate that. But then as a person grows, as I said, and you see more capacities and powers in them, then I think it's, it's also instructive to have that person develop uh, more of an eldership or more of an open-mindedness to the, to the whole predicament, maybe be able to uh, care for, uh, love some of the people who look difficult for them. That even includes, in my mind, Will, let's say there's a, let's say that I, I watched a, a workshop many years ago like this. There was a white person who said something offensive to a black person. I don't remember what the words were, but most people would say, e yikes, they would cringe or think that was terrible or think that was racist. And then many of us, uh, including myself, us more or less white looking folks, got really upset with that other, the white person. Look what you just did. That was gross. We're going to point it out to you. And I remember the, the teacher of this workshop, an African-American man, said to me and some of the other white folks, you got to start loving this guy because there's no way he's going to be able to take the criticism from the, this black brother who's now upset with him. He can't do it. You better sit there and look at him and see good things about him also and see things that you care about in him. You're going to have to give him enough inner resource enough respect in some way for him to be able to take on the criticism in the world. He said, you have a responsibility. Build that guy up a little bit, genuinely. Anyway, that was a big teaching for me, something I had never thought about because I also had a righteous anger about that person's racial bias, which wasn't really helping very much. Even the racism, the racial animus, the prejudice also needs to be held in a certain way. Who can do that? I shouldn't ask, in that case, the African-American to hold it. They're being assaulted. But then, uh, then anybody who's an elder, maybe that would be an African-American elder. Maybe that would be you or I. It would be good then to hold that person, take a look at that, unpack that. Let's talk about, let's take a look at that animus, that bias you have. Maybe you have a power in you. Maybe you feel inferior in some way. Maybe there's something that you're needing also that uh, I could understand rather than put down that's going to help you and maybe the entire problem. Because if we don't do that, then that person is going to basically just be shoved away and alienated in the same way that the, the, part, the part of the woman that says, no, I want my caramel lattes or the, the young man who's spitting, that that is not going to go away. It's still there. And I think that actually is kind of what's been happening is a lot of people have been withdrawing from this uh, discussion because they do just feel accused. Right, we need to start building building relationship with each other. That's right, and not just doing things that injure that relationship, but build relationship. Then we could all say stupid things and hurtful things and still make relationship, make community, make democracy out of that. Mm -hmm. And David, where have you been bringing this perspective in in your work? I know you're also involved, as well as a therapist, you're also involved as, as a teacher. Tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing around privilege and social justice issues and power issues. There's a few major ways that I try to uh, continue my work. I teach doing classes in workshops. Some things, sometimes it's on social issues. Sometimes it's on ethics for counselors. And then I do a, a, a private practice there also. I try to engage people in their inside life, as it were, or the relationship life. Um, and then I do uh, regular writing for Huffington Post and Psychology Today. So in all these arenas, I try to take a look at the dilemmas that individuals or groups bring and try to bring this perspective. What's going on? What are the voices unseen or unheard? And if I can bring those out, how does that uh, edify us uh, about the situation and how to how to make some healing. And how can people get in touch with you to find out more about your work? The best website would be uh, talkingbacktodrphil.com. So it's talkingbackto.drphil.com. 
dot com, and there they can get they can find out about me and my practice. They can reach me. They can get links to listen to videos or audio about things I've lectured on. Or they can get links to a lot of the things I've written, excerpts to the book, etc. David Bedrick, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Awesome. Awesome, Will. You've been listening to an interview with David Bedrick. He's a process work therapist with a background in family law as a lawyer. He's a writer and teacher, and it has a column on the Huffington Post website as well as for Psychology Today. He's the author of the new book, Talking Back to Dr. Phil, Alternatives to Mainstream Psychology. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, Portland Hearing Voices, and Freedom Center. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall and producer is Leah Harris. Madness Radio is based at KBOO in Oregon and can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network. Listen on the internet at madnessradio.net and on iTunes. Contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.